Internet era business models have proven very challenging for print era copyright regimes. Many authors supported by advertising now give their work away for free. Reconciling the desire for wide distribution with the desire for control has proven challenging for the law. And deep linking is a good illustration of how applying print and broadcast era concepts can result in uncertainty and in un unintended consequences and in even a bit of confusion. Now when a user goes to look at a web page on their browser, there are a number of different things that happen in order for the user to actually see the web page. So the first thing that happens is the user clicks on a link or they may enter the URL directly. But it's actually quite unusual now for people to enter the URLs themselves. So the user clicks on a link and then the network routes the request for the relevant HTML file to the web server. So the web server is a computer somewhere and its only job is to accept requests for files and send them back to the person that was looking for them. So the web server will locate the file and then send it to the user's browser. Any images that are in the web page are coded as additional links and so the browser may request the images and then the browser will lay out the page according to the specifications in the HTML. And if you know anything about this, you know that there's CSS involved as well and various other things. As part of that process, a number of things might happen that would under normal circumstances constitute copying and be considered an infringement of copyright law. When you're looking at a web page on your computer, for example, your computer is storing a copy of that page. That's copying there, for example. Now, obviously, the law has no interest in stopping the World Wide Web from working. And so Directive 2001-29EC, usually known as the Copyright Directive, makes specific provision for these kinds of things. So Article 5 provides a copyright exemption for temporary acts which are transient and an integral and essential part of a technological process and whose sole purpose is to enable transmission in a network between third parties. Recital 33 says that exceptions should include acts which enable browsing. So it's clear here from Article 5 and Recital 33 that the Copyright Directive doesn't want to do anything that would restrict normal web browsing. That would be crazy. But a number of issues have come up nonetheless. Now the law has tried to deal with Napster type situations or streaming site scenarios where a copy isn't transmitted by talking about communication to the public. So Article 8 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty, for example, says that authors of literary and artistic works shall enjoy the exclusive right of authorising any communication to the public of their works by wire or wireless means including the making available to the public of their works in such a way that members of the public may access these works from a place and at a time individually chosen by them. So this is to try and catch illegal streaming services by giving authors the exclusive right to authorise communication to the public. The same phrase turns up in Directive 2001-29EC, or the Copyright Directive, and Article 3, one of this says member states shall provide authors with the exclusive right to authorise any communication to the public of their works. But this has given rise to the somewhat surprising question, in my view, is linking to a website communication to the public? And this is a question that the courts have been asked to grapple with. The computer scientist in me wants to say, duh, no, but the courts have not taken that view. It is a reasonable question. If we consider a Napster type scenario where we have two users who are exchanging files and we have Napster or a service like it that is not itself doing any copying but simply providing user A with a link to a work that has been put online by user B and put online illegally, 
this peer-to-peer -peer service isn't itself doing any copying. It's just providing links to an illegal copy. And we can see how this can pose a challenge to copyright law because there is no copying. So that's why we do have a communication to the public provision. But the question has arisen, do other things fall into this category? Similarly, a site might not actually host any illegal content itself, but merely provide users with links to illegally hosted content elsewhere. One could see how that kind of linking could well constitute infringing behaviour. In the end, the question about whether a link constitutes communication to the public actually came up in relation to the newspaper industry and news aggregators. So online publishing has posed a challenge to print media. Newspapers get money from subscriptions, from sales of the newspaper and from advertising in the newspaper. However, in the very early days of the internet, people got into the habit of getting content for free and many newspapers find it difficult now to persuade customers to actually pay for content. The most that they can hope for is that many customers will come through the front door of their website and see ads that can generate revenue for them. Major newspapers get a lot of traffic this way and the Irish Times, for example, would get a lot of people coming directly to the website and coming in through the front door. And it's easy to see how an ad on the front page of the Digital Irish Times would command a high price. However, news aggregators that link to stories from different sources interfere with this business model. An aggregator is an application or service that is programmed to regularly visit a website and summarize its contents. News aggregators are especially popular because they allow users to quickly see headlines without actually visiting the news sites. Then clicking on an item of interest brings the user to the full story on the publisher's website. Aggregators can drive traffic to the website and news publishers encourage aggregation by providing headlines with links to full stories in a standard format. This can be an RSS feed, for example. However, some aggregators add value by sorting and editing and curating links. When such services add so much value that they can generate revenue, publishers feel entitled to share in this revenue. Now, you could have a news aggregator application on your desktop, but one of the most popular news aggregators is Google News. So Google News provides a selection of top stories from various news sites and then provides direct links to those stories. So some users might just read the headlines and not visit the newspaper website. Maybe they've got enough of their news from that. And those that do go directly to the story often bypass the front page of the newspaper. So there's a last opportunity there for the newspaper to generate some revenue but there would still be advertising space next to the story. And so the newspaper can generate income from there. However, many newspapers feel that this direct linking is costing them money, but they also believe that Google is generating income and generating traffic on the backs of their content. The question has come up, is linking to a news story communication to the public? The first case to deal with this issue was actually way back in 1997 in Scotland. So the Shetland Times published news stories on the web. The Shetland News website published headlines with links to the Shetland Times stories. So the Shetland News didn't actually produce any content itself, it only provided links to the Shetland Times content. So someone would go to the Shetland News, see a headline, click on the story that they were interested in and be taken to the Shetland Times. 
However, the Shetland Times felt that by enabling people to go to the Shetland News first, the newspaper was losing out on potential advertising revenue. The Shetland Times sued and was granted an interim interdict, which is Scottish law speak for an injunction. And the case was eventually settled out of court, but the Shetland News essentially stopped what it was doing. In this case, the court was never actually decided to issue a judgment on the issue. And so the big question as to whether providing a link constitutes a copyright infringement was never actually answered. Now, once a user clicks on a link or enters a URL into the browser, the communication is between the user's browser and the web server. The provider of the link has no further role in this. But there are actually different kinds of links. And when considering this issue, it's worth taking a closer look at these different kinds of links. The most straightforward kind of link is a simple link from one website to another. But we can also have links with snippets. There may be framed links, which are a bit different. And then, of course, there may be links to illegal copies of works. That's a different scenario also. Let's look at each of these individually. So it's possible for one web page to have a simple link to another web page. So in this scenario, the HTML on the first web page says, here's an interesting story. And if the user clicks on that text that says interesting story, if they click on that hyperlink, they'll be taken directly to the Irish Times website and this particular story. Typically, however, a link gives the user some sort of a clue as to what to expect if the link is clicked on. And so a news aggregator, for example, will typically copy the headline of the news story and make that part of the link. So in this scenario here, there's a snippet of text from the site that's being linked to and that appears on the page that's doing the linking. This might be just the headline itself, or it might even include some of the text of the story. While it's arguable that headlines for news stories are so short that they're not worthy of copyright protection in their own right, it's clear that the first paragraph of a news story is protected by copyright. And so that becomes an issue. Framing is quite an unusual practice, and that often goes unnoticed to the person who is looking at a page that has framing. So HTML allows web pages to be divided into separate areas that can each display content from different websites. Each area essentially acts as a separate browser within the browser. And this is called framing. Now, aggregators that use framing don't actually make any copies of the content, but they merely direct the user's browser to the publisher's website. So in this scenario here, the page on the left hasn't actually made a copy of the story from the page on the right. It's just incorporated it into a frame on the page. Now, when framing like this occurs, it's not always done with the best interests of the original publisher in mind. Advertising might be removed or obscured. And of course, additional advertising might be added around the frame from which the original publisher gets no benefit. It's also possible to embed content or to embed media in a page. HTML files cannot themselves contain images in the way that, say, a PDF or a Word document can. HTML files can only link to media, which is then downloaded separately by the user's browser and displayed with the rest of the page. Typically, both the image and the web page are stored on the publisher's web server, but they don't need to be. And once an image has been published online, it can be referenced separately 
from the page that contained it in the first place, and also separately from any revenue generating mechanisms that might have accompanied its original publication. So audio, streaming audio, video, and other media such as photographs can all be exploited in the same way, independently of the original publisher's website. And this embedding can be done in a way that is not even noticed by the user. The content may well appear to be coming from somewhere other than its original source. This is especially problematic for photographs because a photograph can be embedded in a web page without it being copied. The HTML code for the web page only needs to reference the URL or the web address of the image on the original site. And when the page is loaded, the user's browser goes and gets the content from the original site and displays it. And no copy is actually made, so it's arguable that there's no copyright infringement as such. But this is clearly not in the best interests of the original publisher of the content. Now, the ease with which infringing copies of works can be duplicated makes it difficult for copyright holders to remove all illegal copies of their work from the web. As infringing copies are removed, they're replaced by others. Various technologies and services have emerged to act as intermediaries between those looking to acquire pirated works and those who offer them. But such intermediaries do not copy any works themselves, nor are they ever in possession of any pirated copies. And so they are difficult to tackle using print era copyright law. Internet era copyright law has addressed the challenges posed by these intermediaries, but the laws developed to deal with them are sometimes applied in inappropriate scenarios. Laws principally designed to prevent linking to unauthorized copies, for example, have been applied to prevent links to authorized copies too. Any thorough consideration of the laws governing linking really need to acknowledge that there are different kinds of linking. Some linking is no more than is required for the internet to function, while other linking is a deliberate attempt to deprive creators of the fruits of their labor. And although technically these links might look the same, the intent and their function is very different. And the law really has a difficult time in dealing with this. And in fact, it hasn't really made the distinction between the form and the function of a link. It hasn't really looked at the consequences of a link or the purpose of the link. And for the most part, it has treated all links the same, which, as we will see, is a bit problematic. Let's take a look at some case law on both sides of the Atlantic. Modern legislation in the US deals extensively with the linking and transmission and caching of copyrighted works online, but it provides guidance on linking only where the link is to an infringing copy of a work. The US Copyright Office has developed comprehensive soft law in the form of the Compendium of US Copyright Office Practices. And that sets out very clearly that URLs are not copyrightable in themselves. But it doesn't give any guidance on the act of linking. It does note, however, that URLs are facts. Ticketmaster versus Tickets.com was an important case that dealt with this. So Tickets.com linked to specific events at the Ticketmaster website and allowed users to buy tickets there. So Tickets.com didn't actually sell tickets. It provided listings you could click on an event that you were interested in, and that would take you to the Ticketmaster website where you could buy the ticket. Ticketmaster wasn't happy about this and sued, but the court found that hyperlinking does not itself involve a violation of the Copyright Act, since no copying is involved. But that wasn't the end of the story in the US. So in SFX v Supercross, this issue came up again, 
where Supercross linked directly to streaming audio on the SFX website. Now, it didn't copy the audio, it just directed users' browsers to the audio that was available from SFX. However, a court in Texas concluded that SFX will likely suffer immediate and irreparable harm when the new racing season begins in mid-December if Davis is not enjoined from posting links to the live racing webcasts. So the problem here was that people could listen to the streaming audio without going directly to the SFX website. And so if people weren't coming through the front door, no advertising revenue was being generated. So on the face of it, these two decisions seem to be in conflict. And one of the problems we have with hyperlinking on the web is the analogy between linking to media and unauthorized retransmission of broadcasts. It's no coincidence that in the Supercross case, it was live audio of a sports event, which feels a lot like live television of a sports event. And so the US courts have decided that unauthorized retransmission of football games, for example, is against the law. And it was the analogy here between hyperlinking and rebroadcasting that caused the problem. And similar cases have come up in Europe. In ITV v TV Catch-Up, for example, the court found that retransmission of free-to-air television over the internet to customers who would otherwise be entitled to view it anyway was not permissible. So TV Catch-Up was showing free-to-air television but on the web. Now it was putting ads along the side which was part of the problem. In this case the court set out that communication to the public included two cumulative criteria. An act of communication and the public. So rebroadcasting television is communication to the public. But it's arguable that that approach doesn't apply to hyperlinking. So in ITV versus ITV catch-up, TV catch-up was taking television off the air, processing it and putting it online and sending it out to individual users. And this was deemed against the law. There was a similar case involving a hotel that made broadcast television available over its closed network within the hotel. So rather than having an aerial on each television in each room, it was essentially piped in using an internal cable system. And in this case, the Court of Justice of the EU adopted a very broad interpretation of communication to the public. And it said that while the mere provision of physical facilities does not as such amount to communication, the distribution of a signal by means of television sets by a hotel to customers staying in its rooms, whatever technique is used to transmit the signal constitutes a communication to the public. It also added that the private nature of hotel rooms does not preclude communication of a work by means of television sets from constituting a communication to the public. A very similar case to the TV catch-up case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. A company, Aereo, tried to avoid the trap that TV catch-up fell into by providing each customer with his own aerial. So it was perfectly legal for someone to connect a server to the television antenna in their home and then stream that service to their computer wherever they might be. Aereo was saying in this case that each individual customer had their own individual antenna that they were in charge of and so this was a situation very different to say a cable company. So in the US free-to-air television stations actually get a lot of income from the cable companies that distribute their free-to-air content. So even though the customers can get it for free with an aerial, cable companies have to pay the TV companies to include them as part of a package. Aereo was trying to bypass this fee structure by providing each individual customer with their own antenna.
Now, this did go all the way to the Supreme Court and Aereo lost. But both in the US and in Europe, the courts have drawn really far too much on the analogy of television when trying to determine whether a hyperlink is communication to the public. So in the TV catch-up scenario, TV catch-up was taking the original content, processing it, and then serving it up to the customers. But when you link to a website on the internet, the linking website has no part in the communication between the site and the reader. The reader and the website are communicating directly. The linker has no part in that. But the courts have nonetheless insisted on drawing on this analogy between television rebroadcasting and providing a link on the web. So the first European case we're going to look at is a German case. And in this case, a new search engine called Paperboy searched newspaper websites and provided search results, including links to the original sources. Now, some of the newspapers had a problem with that, but the highest federal court in Germany, the Bundesgerichtshof, found that this did not constitute a communication to the public in the sense of German law nor in the sense of the Information Society Directive, and so it did not infringe copyright. Now, in Norway, a website was posting links to illegally uploaded MP3s. So this is definitely at the far end of what we might consider reasonable. But the Supreme Court of Norway held that posting links did not constitute an act of making them available to the public. It said simply making a website address known by rendering it on the internet is not making a work publicly available. This must be the case independent of whether the address concerns lawfully or unlawfully posted material. And so linking to something is not making it available to the public. It's already there online. You're just making that known. Now, Svensson is the most important case in Europe that deals with this issue. And this went all the way to the Court of Justice of the EU. So a website called Retriever was linking to stories in this Swedish newspaper. And journalists who work for the newspaper took the view that providing those links was a communication to the public. They took this case in Sweden and the Swedish court asked the Court of Justice of the EU to rule on what was meant by communication to the public. So they sought to prevent a news monitoring service from linking to the articles that they had written, and this was referred to the Court of Justice of the EU. Now, the articles were available for free, so this newspaper wasn't behind a paywall, for example. But in its ruling, the Court of Justice relied heavily on the earlier cases that related to broadcast television, and so the decisions they came to were somewhat controversial. But we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Bestwater was another case involving links, but in this case the content was embedded. So a company made a promotional video for use on their website. I think they actually put it on YouTube and embedded the link on their website. And their competitors embedded a link to the same video on their websites. And so they asked the courts to decide if this was acceptable. Now, much to everyone's surprise, the Court of Justice of the EU decided that providing a link to a website does constitute an act of communication to the public. Now, that would have huge consequences. It would basically shut down the World Wide Web. But they said it was not to a new public. So where communication to the public occurs, but the communication is to a public that had access to the work already, it's not a new public. Now, this is quite a difficult decision to get your head around. So it said that linking to websites that are freely available on the web is legal. And it went further and said that that linking is perfectly fine, even when the work appears in such a way as to give the impression that it is appearing on the site on which that link is found, whereas in fact it comes from another site. So this means that 
embedding in frames is also legal. So linking to an image would be perfectly fine, for example, or having a frame on a page and embedding someone else's page in there is perfectly fine also. In Bestwater, it came to a similar decision. That's not surprising. But Bestwater went further and said that transclusion is explicitly permitted. So if something is available online, you can actually pull it in and display it as part of your content. Now, the Swedish courts, as an aside, asked how much room national states had to make their own rules. And in their ruling, the Court of Justice of the EU said that the internal market would be adversely affected if individual countries could have stricter rules and that the directive would be undermined. So it turns out there's not much scope for national differences. So even if Swedish lawmakers wanted to provide additional protection to copyright holders, it's not clear that they would be allowed to do that. In Svensson, the substantive issue was whether or not provision of a hyperlink constitutes an act of communication. And the court never really addressed this issue. The TV analogy is not a very good one. And the Svensson case and the TV cases were different. In ITV versus TV catch-up, TV catch-up acted as an intermediary between the broadcasters and the end consumers of the services. There was a chain of communication that began with the broadcaster, included TV catch-up, and ended with the users. But in the case of a hyperlink to a website, the communication is between the user and the website. The provider of the hyperlink is nowhere in there in the chain of communication between the user and the website. So some people have argued that a hyperlink is like the card index in a library. It only identifies the precise location of a book. It's not the same as giving you the book. And it provides no more, for example, than a print ad in a newspaper to giving you a website's address would. Now, if infringement requires communication and a new public, then some undesirable practices may be permitted. In the Svensson decision, the court not only fails to acknowledge the distinction between linking and embedding, despite submissions that highlighted the difference, but it explicitly permitted embedding of content from other websites. And that has implications for photographers, for example, since images can be included in web pages merely by providing a link to them. So authors of web pages need never request permissions to use them. And the owner of that image can do nothing about that. The decision in Bestwater explicitly permits that kind of practice. So in addition to photographers being disadvantaged by this, there may be some other consequences. It's possible, for example, that more content will be locked away behind, say, a paywall, because if there's a paywall, you are communicating to a new public, people who haven't paid. It may even encourage the use of logins to websites, even if they're free, because if you need credentials to sign into a website to view the content, then again, the new public kicks in there. And so requiring a sign-in might be a way for content owners to get some additional protection. This would probably lead to the increased use of single sign-ons and things like Google and Facebook, for example. And of course, that would actually have knock-on consequences for privacy and stuff. No, of course, law doesn't operate in a vacuum. There is law and there's politics and there's also market forces. And there have been some interesting developments in Germany and in Spain on the foot of the Svensson decision. So the Svensson decision made it clear that providing a link is OK. Because although that is a communication to the public, it's not a new public. However, the likes of Google News was doing more than just linking. It was also using snippets. And so because it was using short snippets of the stories, there were still copyright issues in play there. 
whether the headlines were worthy of copyright is possibly arguable, but certainly a snippet of the story was definitely covered by copyright. Now, in Germany, some newspapers wanted Google News to pay them for linking to their articles. But instead, Google provided them with an opt-out. It said, well, if you don't want us linking to your articles, Google won't do that. But Google wouldn't pay. But rather than this being a huge victory for the newspapers, they found that they lost out on so much traffic that they voluntarily opted in to Google News in Germany. A similar thing happened in Spain, but a law was passed there to make it difficult for newspapers to voluntarily opt back in without payment. And so Google did away with Google News in Spain altogether. However, there does seem to be some political pressure in Europe to require the likes of Google and other businesses and social networks to pay for linking to content. So Gunther, Gunther Oettinger was the EU Commissioner for the Digital Economy and Society from 2014 to 2016. And he said that when Google links to works that contain intellectual property from the EU, that Google can be asked to pay a fee for doing that. Abgabe translates as fee in this context. So in summary then, notwithstanding what we know about how the internet works, and notwithstanding the fact that television and hyperlinking are really quite different, the Court of Justice of the EU is quite clear that linking to a website does constitute an act of communication to the public. But that's okay as long as it is not a new public. So that's a little bit muddled. But I think it is a good illustration of what happens if you're taking print era principles or even broadcast era copyright principles and applying them to new scenarios. Sometimes the law has a difficult time in finding a good fish.